Greetings, everyone, and welcome to today's HSMEI Europe web broadcast. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Tim Wiersma. I will be today's moderator as we explore the topic of leadership in changing times, a conversation on how best to manage in times like these as we address the COVID-19 situation. I am joined here by two very esteemed colleagues, Anant Vithani, he's the Vice President, Sales uh, sales for Nordic Choice Hotels. He's responsible for B2B sales for approximately 200 hotels in the Nordic region. He's also the chair of the HSMEI Sales Advisory Board. And also joining today is Mark Hayward. He's Senior Vice President and Head of Europe at Rate Gain Technologies. In his current role, he manages a commercial team throughout Europe, North Africa, the Caucasus, and Brazil and leads the overall strategy for growth across all three business lines of distribution, business, business intelligence and social media optimization in these regions. I will ask the two of them to say a little bit more about themselves a little bit later in the presentation. I'd also like to acknowledge Enzo Aita, uh, who is uh, with Funnel TV and made this broadcast possible here today. And a little bit more about myself. I'm the principal and owner of Revenue Generation LLC, a hospitality consulting firm specializing in developing revenue strategies for portfolios and individual assets. My previous experience includes work with host hotels and resorts, a real estate investment trust here in North America, uh, Starwood Hotels and Resorts, Red Roof, and two other private equity firms. I'm also the chair of the Revenue, revenue Optimization Board here in North America. Now on to today's topic. I'll put together a brief presentation regarding the current situation we find ourselves in. Uh, following that, I will open up the discussion to Anant and Mark, and you will also have the opportunity to ask questions via the chat link during the our time together here today. So let's go ahead and uh, get started. Enzo, if you can uh, put the presentation up on the screen, that'd be great. So leadership in changing times, the conversation on how best to uh, handle situations like we're in right now. Next slide, uh, just the, some of the fine print here, the code of ethics um, that we always need to uh, cover at the beginning. Uh, the discussions, I won't read the whole thing, but uh, just kind of highlight a couple things here. Uh, discussions and issues presented at the meeting um, today is proprietary. Um, and um, needs approval uh, for release. Um, next page uh, talks about the uh, code of uh, ethics, uh, you know, more specifically among the uh, subjects which uh, members should never discuss with competitors are rates, surcharges, conditions, terms, and prices of service, allocation of sharing of customers, and refusing to deal with a particular supplier or class of suppliers. Such discussions often lead to agreements and agreements among, among or between competitors regarding any of these subjects are per se violations of antitrust laws and can lead to severe criminal and civil penalties. HSMAI and the Advisory Board Council strictly prohibit any discussions. So there you go, the legal stuff is out of the way. Let's get on to the presentation then. So the next slide. So our objective today is just talk a little bit more about uh, the current situation with the COVID-19, um, where we are in the world today, uh, the impacts on our industry. And then uh, we'll be talking about uh, leadership uh, during times like this. And then we'll open it up. Uh, majority of our time will be spent um, asking questions and having a dialogue with you um, as to how to best address and lead in times like these. So uh, we've all seen them. The headlines are, are very scary right now. There's a lot to keep us up at night. Um, and uh, it's very easy for us to um, panic in, in situations like this. Um, if you go move to the next slide, um, this is a, a picture of what the world looks like as of this morning. Um, as of this morning, there's over 95,000 confirmed cases. It's likely higher than that because a lot of testing has just started. Uh, the number of deaths uh, as of uh, today is uh, over 3,200. Um, 
If there is any silver lining, um, there's also 53,000 uh, recovered cases already. So um, the recovery seems to happen about uh, two weeks after uh, they're diagnosed. Next slide. So what we need to know about uh, the COVID, uh, should we be scared? Yes, we can be scared, uh, but now is not the time to panic. Uh, instead, the effect, uh, we need to be effective in our communication and with the facts of the situation. I think the more that you can bring out the facts of the situation, the lower the anxiety levels will be. And, and the more effectively we can communicate that, um, the more effective you know, you know, we can be at reducing the num the amount of panic out there. Who needs to worry about this? Well, uh, like the flu, elderly people uh, with underlying health conditions, people with compromised immune systems um, are all at risk. As leaders in the hospitality industry, we need to ensure we be uh, concerned about every the well-being of all of our guests at our uh, hotels. And we need to pay close attention to what local public uh, health authorities and uh, government uh, authorities are saying. And uh, we make sure we need to adhere to anything um, that they're asking us to do. Great example is ITB was canceled last week uh, in Germany uh, upon the direction of the German government. How fast is the disease spreading? And how bad is it? Well, it, it's pretty bad. Uh, it's spreading uh, two or three times faster than the flu. Uh, so we really need to be vigilant and continue to monitor the local situation closely. And it, again, adhere to any recommendations uh, within your local market there. What is the f fatality rate? Um, the fatality rate currently is 3.4% worldwide. Um, that's quite a bit higher than the average flu virus. Um, so we really do um, need to pay close attention to that. And uh, more importantly, if the outbreak gets bad, um, such as what happened in Wuhan, um, it's going to overtax uh, the healthcare system. And uh, the number of fatalities can go up in that case if we can't treat um, the patients. Um, obviously, the fatality rate will go up there. Next slide. So just some data and uh, just, uh, you know, I, I pulled some slides uh, from Smith Travel Research and a lot of it is very preliminary data at this point. Um, you can see the, uh, for Asia, the first area that was impacted, uh, the occupancy levels um, in almost all, all major markets um, has seen significant uh, declines. Um, take a look at uh, Macau, for example. They were running 97% occupancy. And now look at their occupancy. Um, they're, they're virtually zero at this point in time. So their hotels are empty, um, and it's, it's a very significant situation. We're starting to um, see that um, in the European market and North American markets as well. So um, definitely um, keep monitoring uh, your individual markets and... Um, and uh, stay on top of that. Uh, next slide. So uh, back uh, when SARS hit, uh, back in 2003, um, you can see uh, the China market in particular um, saw a, a significant decline uh, going down from 80% all the way down to probably on average about 20% occupancy. Uh, but then you can see once the uh, travel restrictions uh, started to ease uh, within that market, uh, that was around June, um, occupancy levels started to rise again. And by July 5th of that year, um, they almost uh, were fully recovered. Uh, so as bad as things look right now, if we do uh, manage to contain this, uh, this situation, Occupancy levels do uh, do have a tendency to come back fairly quickly again. Next slide. Um, also, um, back in the downturn, uh, 2008, 2009, um, what we saw, uh, transient demand uh, bounced back pretty quickly uh, during that time period. 
Uh, however, uh, group demand um, did not bounce back quickly. It took much longer uh, for group demand to recover. Obviously, um, managing uh, rescheduling groups is difficult. Um, and um, <clears throat> so we can expect uh, probably the same type of situation to occur um, in the in what we're where we are right now as well and then uh, as far as adr we'll talk a lot about adr today um and and the recovery aspect of it um you can see uh during uh the downturn or downturn of 9 11 <clears throat> the adr took about 12 months to kind of bottom out and then um, it took a long time, 24 months, to get back to the pre-9-11 um, ADR in North America here. And uh, we find that um, in, we found that situation in many of the downturns um, where it, you know, if, you, if you drop rates significantly, it's just really difficult to get back to previous levels again. There. Okay, so just uh, talking about some of the uh, decision-making framework here. Again, um, having as much information uh, in your local market um, that you can uh, obtain, and we'll talk a little bit about um, what you can obtain um, in your local markets as far as uh, trending information, pricing information, and so on. Um, it's important that you you uh, review that on a, a regular basis and it's important to develop a solid framework of making critical decisions based on that data. Uh, this helps you manage your emotions as you deal with anxiety and pressure brought on by this business crisis. Um, the use of uh, questions um, you ask during the information gathering phase is um, in order to ensure that you consider a wide range of options and uh, do not avoid making critical decisions, but rather consider consequences of implementing each option and really take time to discuss that with your leadership teams. Uh, as far as accountability is concerned, when circumstances collide uh, to put together, put up barriers uh, for their achievement, uh, you may have to reassess your goal. Obviously, uh, you know, in many cases, uh, budgets will not be achieved this year. And uh, so you really need to reassess your goals and continue to reassess your goals as more information comes out. Uh, staying ahead of stakeholder expectations is important. Um, I know many times uh, dealing with owners, uh, the last thing they like uh, is surprises. So uh, be as transparent with them as possible and feed as much information to them uh, so that they can stay informed. Uh, leaders share accountability with uh, other members on their team. Uh, so it's, it's not on our shoulders completely, but uh, we need to share that accountability, uh, which happens to deepen team bonds uh, while creating stretch challenges for them too. And then the use of uh, outside sources and expertise advice. Um, there's a lot of uh, resources out there. Uh, Mark uh, will talk about some of the, uh, the plethora of information that he has available uh, for us as an industry today, um, but also uh, sources like Smith Travel Research, your own uh, business intelligence markets, your OTA, um, BI uh, information, um, all can be very helpful in understanding those options. Um, and then uh, get some outside expertise in to uh, help you um, kind of gain perspective, uh, run by scenarios to them. Uh, as well, uh, so that uh, you can kind of validate what you're thinking there. And then finally, uh, just some practical things um, that I pulled um, from um, uh, a publication by Nancy Hang at uh, Pegasus. Uh, she talks about uh, our revenue management systems. Obviously, um, they're you know we're in that special event uh, time period right now. Uh, unlike any before, and uh, we really need to make sure that uh, our RMS systems understand uh, what's happening with transient demand, the number of cancellations going on right now. Uh, so making sure that you uh, continuously seed that information into the system. Uh, review booking cancellations. 
Um, is your is your leisure segment uh, decreasing? Are you seeing a downturn in OTAs? Um, in the event of a crisis, you'll need to determine if cancellation patterns are arising from specific markets and then address them accordingly. Uh, rim night pickup. Where are you seeing uh, productivity? Where are you not seeing productivity? There may be certain markets, like drive markets, um, that uh, maybe were not a big part of your business before, but may suddenly become a greater uh, part of it because people are afraid to travel uh, by airline. And then, of course, uh, monitoring your local airport airline flights and can cancellations and really um, take that into account uh, for your arrivals a uh, particular day, but also um, where, where you're seeing um, the demand dry up there as well. So that's really the end of uh, the PowerPoint presentation. Um, now I want to go ahead and uh, start the discussion with uh, Mark and Avant. So um, Mark, I'm gonna um, ask you first. Uh, first off, um, maybe you can just tell us a little bit more about uh, some of your past experience, um, who you've been with and uh, your, your own personal experience and some of the downturns that uh, you've experienced. Yeah, definitely. So I've been um, in the hospitality industry for 23 years now, and I've really been on the side of the hotelier for the bulk of that. Um, about, I would say about 15 of those years was as a hotelier managing the commercial operation, revenue, sales, marketing, in different companies such as Melia, the Unlisted Collection, the Ascot Group. But then in more recent years with rate gain, with travel click before rate gain as well, looking at the technology, the distribution, the business intelligence side of the industry. And you know, in that 23 year period, which has flown by um, hilariously, um, you know, we've had a lot of different market events that have happened to us. There was the volcanic eruption in Iceland, SARS, 9-11, all of these things now with COVID-19 as well that are taking place, all of them have raised very serious concerns to the industry for me as a hotelier, for me as a distribution partner, for me as an e-commerce expert. Um, so, you know, I, I've been very heavily involved in, in my own personal career and at the same time working with now many different hoteliers and agencies around what they can do to um, overcome these points. Great, thank you. Anand, I'm going to ask the same question to you. Well, I worked in the hotel industry almost around 18 years. I started after directly after 9-11. So I experienced the crisis of both 9-11 uh, and the Lehman Brothers crash. Uh, during that time of period, I used to work at the same hotel as I'm sitting at right now, Stockholm's largest hotel, Clarence Sun. I opened it. So I really experienced when we went up on a high boom and then just crashed down with the almost an echo on the booking department. Uh, my responsibility is mainly B2B sales. Uh, and we are approximately 500 sales people in the Nordic region uh, working with uh, corporate agreements and direct sales like uh, meeting events, groups, events, uh, incentives and so on. So, uh, yeah, I'm glad to share my thoughts today about uh, how this price could be actually mitigated. Great. Thank you, Anna. Mark, uh, next question. Uh, rate gain is connected to over 125,000 hotels worldwide via the uh, connectivity switch disco. Um, and also the channel manager uh, res gain. What are your own figures and stats uh, looking like for Europe and globally currently? Okay. So, you know, I guess as you said at the start of the discussion, there is a downturn in reservations globally and we're aware of that. Um, however, you know, before I fully answer the question, I just have to say to people, we all have to be aware of some of the information and some of the news that's in circulation. So I was reading a really provocative um, kind of article recently around a 90% cancellation rate. And then as I delved deeper into the article, it was really referencing the volume of reservations booked into one market being Italy. Um, and, you know, it was initially positioned as being something that was 
Europe in general is completely um, dropping and not just purely the data on Italy. That being said, um, you know, Italy for us on the rate gain side, looking at both Disco distribution and the Res Gain channel manager, we're still seeing Italy at an 80% drop um, year on year, which is alarming, but not to be um, surprised by it. We've also seen that the drop rate of reservations hasn't all taken place purely in the last two weeks since everyone's been getting more emotional about the situation. We've actually seen that there's been a steady decline since the start of this year in reservations across generally all channels. Um, as we've seen that coming in, there was in January a decrease of about 15%. February of 10%, but then March, even though we're only five days in now, we're already seeing a 27% decline in transactions. So, you know, March has got a very big impact um, for the industry. But when I have a look um, a little bit further around the globe, I was doing a bit of a deep dive into Asia, because obviously Asia is a market where everything started from and where everyone's been more concerned about for a longer period of time. And it was interesting to have a note that the global OTAs dropped 21% in Asia Pacific, whereas the regional OTAs only saw a drop of 3%. So there's clearly a strategy thing that's starting to point out that we can learn for in Europe that whilst global travel going into a market is going to be declined because people don't want to be taking the risk of doing that business trip or that leisure trip. The domestic internal travel is lesser impacted and normally people are more willing to travel within their own country or their own market than doing the longer haul trips. So I thought that was a very good learning um, for me personally and hopefully for the audience around Asia Pacific. But then, you know, being European, as you can tell by my accent, um, I, I looked a little bit deeper at the European market. And what I started to find in the European market as well was, whereas the OTAs have been dropping a lot stronger, bookings on someone's direct website on their own booking engines actually have declined at a far lesser pace. Hmm. So there's been a stronger decline on the OTAs. We can debate the value of OTAs and who books on the OTAs, I'm sure, for hours. but. The, you know, the people who seem to be more brand loyal that are booking directly at property level seem to be retaining some of that loyalty, whereas the OTA clients who maybe shop around a little bit more, there seems to be a starker um, decline from them. And then, you know, as I looked even further, if we're saying that there's been a decline since the start of January, March, we're only five days in. What I noticed actually was in the last two weeks alone, they were the biggest drops possible. So this week we've seen a 38% drop of total reservations being processed across our client base. And, you know, there are some key reasons for that. Obviously, the cancellation of ITB, cancellation of IHF, the cancellation of many other events, the increase of cases being reported throughout Europe. Um, but, you know, when I look at it, I think we're still on a data analytical basis. We're still only maybe really a couple of weeks into the severity of this. And we've seen a decline in the lead up whilst things were hotting up in Asia. But as we get into it, impact in Europe, it's really the last two weeks where data starts to see us at 38% drops in different markets. The other thing I thought was interesting within Europe is that outside of Italy, which everyone is most concerned about, France has actually seen a 52% decline in that same period as well across all channels that we can see that we're tracking on either rate shopping, the disco connectivity switch or our channel management. So, you know, not everything is purely as it seems, I would say. Okay, thank you, Mark. That is interesting um, that you're seeing the OTA uh, drop um, more so than uh, property direct. And perhaps it has something to do also with uh, negotiated rates and the lo more loyal customers um, still um, 
coming to our hotel. So that's uh, very good, good uh, information to know. Anat, um, how does group um, and negotiated tran transient channels, uh, how, what are you seeing, uh, what have you seen uh, in the last uh, few weeks and what are you seeing uh, moving forward? Well, I can just add on what Mark said about general markets. We can see that our ma major market is dropping in March quite quite quickly. So if you look at the re red bar figures, Stockholm just during the last few days have dropped by 25% in red bar. And uh, uh, if you look 30 days back, the drop in Stockholm was 1.1%. <coughs> so it's a quite huge change. And Copenhagen has dropped from minus 9% for, if you look during the period of 30 days to up to... Uh, the last few days in March is dropped by almost 40 percent. So there is there is a big drop in demand. And uh, if you look to, to the corporate clients we have, uh, most of the bigger corporate clients they have uh, clear travel restrictions, uh, special travel restrictions to those areas that are affected. Uh, and uh, but it also affects the local. You said that the domestic travel has less impact. But but we see that the travel restrictions is that they don't recommend domestic travel. But uh, if you don't, if it's not business, business crucial, so it of course affects the domestic travel as well. As uh, I have indication on on uh, colleagues in the industry yeah. as well, they feel yeah. that there is a big drop on the corporate travel. Uh, so so, uh, and we have also started to see a lot of cancellations on groups and meetings. Uh, I just received an email today where, where, where one of our major clients is changing big meeting now in March. They would like to change, shift it or change it to June. The problem is that we are really close to the, uh, the cancellation policy is already gone. We have to actually take full pay. And uh, it's a bit, comp there are a lot of complicated situations because we try to follow the cancellation rules since it's, it's a country which is not fully affected. Uh, so, Participants are not coming from either Italy or China or European countries, and, and there is no uh, governmental instructions that this, these areas. There is actually no, no no restrictions within traveling within Europe uh, right now. But that no. feel that clients are actually panicking some some of them and doing some cancellations. Right now. Yes, there is a big impact in, on on uh, corporate travel, both the B two B individual and groups okay thank you uh so uh just a reminder to the audience if you have questions so uh, please feel free to uh, open up your chat box and uh, and put your questions in there we'll be uh, sure to try to answer as many as possible there so um let's talk about uh discounting a little bit and um i'll ask the two of you to to talk about this um is there any advantage at all to reducing your, your pricing right now? Um, do you think you can still share? And uh, if so, um, how, how best to do that? And if yeah. not, um, tell me a reason why not. Definitely. So, you know, th this is one of the things that we see when we're looking at all of the different business intelligence tools that exist. When you're in a situation, I, I always kind of go back to the Icelandic volcano for some reason. When you're in a situation where there's limited new demand for occupancy, where there's less people coming in, really having a race to the bottom on price doesn't actually stimulate extra growth of occupancy. It can negatively impact the bottom line heavily. Um, and what we tend to see when, you know, when we look at all of the companies that I've worked for and probably all of them that I'll work for in the future. Whenever we look at this sort of data, the level of occupancy that's going to come into a market during a situation like we're seeing now, like we saw with the volcano, like we saw with SARS, 9-11, etc. That occupancy tends not to really move an awful lot. And people are still picking hotels based on the service, the location, the necessity why they want to be there. So discounting your rate, will it give you extra business? Normally not heavily. And what we normally find is when people start to drop their rates in the marketplace, 
they're just robbing Peter to pay Paul and the market overall sits kind of with the same level of occupancy. The revenues all drop down between everyone. Um, so there are people out there that will drop rates definitely. And there's probably a lot of people that are dropping rates already. We can see that there are certain markets where people are dropping rates further than they should be in this situation. But you know, the overall answer to you there around Will it stimulate extra occupancy? Will it help you? Normally not, because normally there's only a finite number of people that are coming in anyway. And they've normally picked you based on where you're located, who you are, et cetera. Um, but it, it's one to keep an eye on. It's one that you know anyone who decides not to use a business intelligence tool or to put media on hold really needs to look at that decision because it may be the wrong one. Thanks. And I would like to, I would like to highlight that to you and all the listeners that please don't drop rates because <laughs> it won't affect at all. And you you showed it quite well, Tim, on your on your presentation where after nine eleven the rates dropped for almost almost twelve months. It took twenty four months to actually get get the rates back up to the level they used to be uh, thirty six months ago. And uh, we have to remember that our industry is a secondary need. So I will only need a hotel in India when I visit my mother-in-law. I won't need it if, because it's cheaper rates in India. So I won't travel from Sweden to India. Uh, yeah. So people have a, a certain need. They go for business travel. They go for leisure travel. Yeah, they are going to some place. And then, then they select uh, accommodation according to the place they visit. So, and that's not rate effective. Yes. So it's, it is, there's is no winners, even the customer that win if we lower the rates, because if we are not profitable, and uh, there will be a lot of properties affected by lower rates, lower demand, and might, might not be able to survive uh, these tough times that we might go into, let's see, of long part. But lowering the rates is really risky. risky. The, other, the other thing that we see from our data is a lot of the people who are influenced by the lower rate and the kind of the lower rate shoppers, they're normally booking the lowest rate possible initially on a non-refundable basis or an advanced purchase yeah. basis. So normally the, the stimulus that people are trying to go for around, let's stimulate more occupancy and get the people that are looking for the lower prices, they're normally not able to shift as many as they expect because the potential shifters that are price sensitive have already locked themselves in on an advanced purchase rate, a non-refundable rate, something that's packaged or opaque already. Um, so even though there's a big tendency to do it, it, it's one to be careful of. And the question is, I was supposed to be in Berlin today and, and we cancelled the ITB uh, and, and I had non-refundable rate. Yeah. There. So the question is for the future now, how much many people would like to select the book now? Fundable rate. Uh, yeah. So, uh, That's actually a very good point. Um, you know, maybe uh, non refundable rates at your property were starting to grow. I would anticipate that um, to, you know, if you're from a marketing standpoint, you might want to highlight um, the flexibility in your cancel clause uh, for particular yeah. weeks right now as well. And yeah. some, something that I did myself earlier this morning was sent an email to our account management and sales team at rate gain and said, moving forward until further notice, do not book any non-refundable rates on hotels or airlines because we know that we have to have flexibility. Almost everyone in my team said to me, that means the prices will be higher. However, that's the necessity <laughs> that um, we live in. Right. Yeah. So, Tim, we have an interesting question here from uh, from David uh, in New York, Migano. When can we expect demand to start showing a recovery? Uh, can, can I give a shot? Yes, please do. I'm, re I'm really not sure, but today I heard uh, uh, experts from uh, the Governmental Institute, uh, some doctors saying that they believe it in, in October this year, they will have uh, uh, this coronavirus under control. So uh, I personally believe that it might be a big part of this year, uh, uh, the demand. So uh, because when we saw SARS, it, it was quite quickly recovered after a few months. But I think this will be uh, longer. But let's see how, how big the effects will be. 
Yeah. That's my personal view. Yeah. And, and if you look at uh, the market like like China, uh, you know, if we, if we can believe the, the stats there, um, they, they seem to be um, kind of plateauing a little bit and in some cases uh, in, in a bit of a recovery mode. Uh, so maybe that's a leading indicator. It's again, it's just probably too early to tell for sure. Um, but uh, I, I would uh, agree with you, Anand, that it's probably a greater part of this year at this point that we're going to feel the effects of it. Yeah. Mark? We also have another question from Ankita. Uh, maybe Mark would like to comment on the first one first. <laughs> um, I, I was actually going to say very similar to you, to be honest with you. Um, you know, normally with something like SARS, we saw that being a very short window, um, the bounce back. However, something like coronavirus, everyone seems to be pinning against more a 9-11 than a SARS. Um, and, you know, the learnings that we saw with Tim's slides earlier on, the bounce back from 9-11 <laughs> took a little bit longer, well, a lot longer on, on things. So, but we just have to see how this one plays out because as the numbers in China are starting to stabilize now, this will have an impact on other markets. Okay, uh, so a question uh, from the audience. Uh, what can be some ancillary revenue or cost saving ideas for an Indian market? And when can we expect the market to be normal as we have many events lined up for 20 and 21? Um, do we have a? Do we have to drop rates? I think uh, we've talked about some of this before. Um, yeah. I just but let's clarify the rate thing. Don't drop the rates. <laughs> yeah, if, if at all possible, um, hold on to your rate. Um, there's actually a webinar next week um, that I would encourage you to um, uh, spend some time watching as well. It's uh, HSMEI North America on uh, pricing psychology. It's uh, a speaker from. Uh, Smith Travel Research, and I've seen the presentation before, and he's done studies in markets uh, of downturn, and he looks at specific um, competitor sets, and he um, he studied those that uh, you know a group of them that had dramatic uh, drops in in rate. They did see a, a shift in demand uh, to their properties. Uh, however, um, on the recovery side of it. Um, they took much longer to re recover uh, simply because, um, you know, when, when they comes time to renegotiate rates or customers get used to that lower rate and all of a sudden you bring your, your pricing back up to the pre-event uh, levels, um, you're going to see significant turnaround. Whereas the properties that uh, maybe they, they drop rate a little bit uh, to respond to market situations, uh, but they didn't drop significantly. Um, their recovery time was much faster. And overall, the net revenue over the entire test period, uh, those that uh, had um, maintained the higher rates uh, were the ones that recovered faster and achieved much higher RevPAR results there. Yeah. Did you guys want to add anything to that? I have fully respect as well as the from Amsterdam is writing that, uh, it, of course, I have full respect. It's difficult to understand how to keep the rates up, but, but yep. uh, it's like Sundays. For those of you who would like to fill up Sundays and have dropped rates, you'll probably see that they know you just lose the rep or you just lose, lose the probability. So, so uh, and, and for example, I've talked a lot about with our key account managers, and when the clients have restrictions on travel, restrictions they really they follow the travel policy, the company say, if they're not supposed to travel, they won't travel. It doesn't matter if you lower the rates, they won't travel. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's the thing you need to learn. We learn, we learn the market to, if you give lower rates, we learn the market that we can actually stand with these rates. That would make it in the long term not good for anyone. Yeah, so uh, uh, leading to this question then is, uh, you know, it's easy. I, I was just gonna comment here. on um, Deanne's yeah. comment, just very, before we go on to the next question, sorry. I, I just wanted to mention um, it, something that quite a few of our partners that we're working with at the moment are looking at is if the domestic market, even though there's a decline, is more buoyant than the international market, there's a lot of our clients who are working at the moment on a strategy around how do we attract more of that local domestic market? 
for example, if we're a hotel who normally goes after corporate conferences but says no to weddings, do we consider dipping our toe into that market? So not discounting what you already have, but looking at other things that complement your offering to that market that you normally avoid. There are some hotels that we work with who have a no OTA policy. It's a good time to dip your toe into the water around if we now connect to A, B, C, D, E, OTAs, will that give any difference? Um, so, you know, something that I just you know would go back to Deanne's point is really, before you drop the rate, look at all of these other ways of stimulating business from the local market, um, because it isn't definitely only about the rate. Yeah, and I think right. maybe that's also a way to answer Ankita's question. Uh, what else revenue can you actually look into? Because I really believe that the domestic market could be something, even if it, it's going to drop a bit, that people will continue to travel because there is always a need to travel uh, and business will be done. So so I, I'm quite sure that the domestic market will recover more faster. Uh, yep. And and uh, I don't have any ideas, cost-saving ideas in your market, but I guess the same same in operations, first thing that you will have to look into uh, hours you work working for and see what you can actually save on. Make sure that you have a flexible operation to meet the demand. And now you uh, you shared something uh, just prior to the call. Um, I'd like to you to kind of comment on it. it has to do with uh, company ratings, um, and I believe it's on the screen here right now. Did you want to talk about this? Yes, I think uh, this is one of the advice that I would like to give to you because uh, if the market, it's not only the hotel industry affected, financial markets are going down figures and uh, a lot of our bigger pro properties has bookings done maybe one or two years ahead, uh, but uh, our bigger conference have a lead time from six months and, and uh, more than that. So we should actually be aware of uh, customers' ratings make sure that uh, because you do a credit check when you uh, and you have this uh, agreement that they pay a certain amount for the arrivals so we should be aware of that maybe the ratings of customers will drop rapidly and we have this is a, a norwegian company that uh, went bankruptcy last week and you can see their rating dropped quite quickly the last month so it was almost impossible for us to actually uh, see that this thing is, this thing is coming up so uh, good advice to all of you is, is to be aware of the clients you have on the books. Uh, how are their payments and uh, ability and make sure that you follow them up properly. I can also say the retail industry, I think that's one of the industries is really in, uh, in trouble because people are buying more and more online. So uh, be, look into which industries are affected more about this uh, coronavirus and, and be aware of that you don't do anything. Okay, thank you. Uh, so kind of a lead into that then, uh, airline routes have started to cancel uh, in many impacted areas. And um, so let's talk about cancellations a little bit. Um, you know, who, who do we let off the hook? Uh, who do we, uh, who do we uh, enforce uh, cancel policies at this point? Um, and I see Anant uh, just left us for a second. So Mark, I'm gonna throw it to you. That's really, um, you know, this subject is a very tricky one because it boils back down to, in a lot of cases, the subject around guest loyalty. And someone this morning had a conversation with me about the very point that we're in exceptional circumstances at the moment. And if you have a regular corporate account, a regular client, a regular event who's coming to you on a regular basis, and you're able to push out the reservation, push out the book into a later date, then that could help you retain that client and that piece of business in the longer term outside of this situation. At the same time, if you don't do that, there's the potential of them shopping around and looking somewhere else. So there's something that needs to be paid attention to around guest loyalty and the value of that guest. At the same time, there's a lot of hotel partners who we're working with on distribution at the moment that have 
a policy that's now going out into the marketplace around if your airline route is cancelled to get into our location, then we will be more flexible with you around the terms of the cancellation, the release of the booking, pushing the booking out, et cetera. However, I think that there's still, you know, based on hotel type, hotel location, market type, and the individual circumstances, and the type of business, there's still a case-by-case -case analysis that has to be done. Um, but definitely, you know, I go back to my first point here, guest loyalty needs to be considered within this equation. And I think that's something that I've noted that the airline industry is doing quite well around, um, you know, pushing things out if they need to. Great. But not always possible in our world of hotels, and I know this the hard way. Yeah. Anant, you're in the middle of it right now. Uh, did you want to uh, add anything to that? Well, I, I would like to add on, especially to the customers, uh, mainly the B2B customers, but I think it is going to be valid for all customer approach. We should actually act so we don't create panic in customers. Uh, so we should actually show them that we know what uh, this co uh, coronavirus is about, how it works, and tell them that we take precautions action that when they visit our hotels, they are not in risk to actually uh, get, get infected. Of course, you can't protect yourself anywhere when you are it's difficult when you're out and maybe you meet people but we should at least communicate that we have taken a lot of precautions uh, in our hotel uh, so the customer feel confident uh, okay. and then yeah great so uh let's talk about uh possible new markets that uh we haven't considered before um you know staycations uh, you talk about people being afraid to fly. Uh, maybe they're still willing to drive. Um, how and how are you looking at that um, with your portfolio? And how are you switching some of your marketing and sales efforts to attract that customer? Uh, we are looking into the digital marketing and see if we could attract uh, with different kind of digital campaigns to our property. So uh, we actually increasing our activities to drive digital direct uh, bookings uh, but we also look to look into different partnerships and partners we have and see what what possibilities do we have uh, but so as, as i told you we believe that people have a certain amount of money that would have planned to do something nice and travel so staycation is definitely a big potential here I will uh, just, you know, speak on on behalf of uh, my previous experience with the economy brand here uh, during downturns in particular markets and so on. We really look at the the segment very closely, uh, and, and other segments uh, within the market itself. So, with uh, Red Roof Inn, for example, uh, there are certain markets where we really had to switch gears, and um, we converted uh, some of our rooms into more of an extended stay. Uh, package, and we went heavily after the extended stay market. Um, there's advantages and disadvantages to that, but uh, we we found that uh, we were able to shift gears and refocus our efforts on what was in market already there. So uh, something to consider for sure. Mark, did you want to? You, you look like you were going to add something. Oh no, um, you covered what I was going to say. So <laughs> okay, great. Um, so let's talk about uh, revenue management um, and all the information that they have um, and, and your market research uh, folks. How can they assist you, Anant? Um, how can they assist leadership in guiding us and, and giving us uh, information that's crucial uh, during this time period? Well, I think if, uh, because there's a lot of feelings going on as you start in your presentation, there's a lot of news coming up and where you can wake up, you can feel really scared. So uh, I think especially the revenue systems and revenue management can actually feed us with facts. So you can actually act on facts based on what's the situation. And then you can, according to the facts, you take take relevant uh, uh, relevant actions. And uh, I, could, I could also comment on actions we can do B2B wise, uh, typical actions uh, and advices. But for example, I, we do overbook today, but maybe the revenue system could tell us and show us that the 
translations rate and we could actually overbook more than we do today uh, and so on so please add on mark definitely um i, I was going to mention so earlier this year the company i work for rate gain launched something called market drone and what yeah. market drone is very good at doing for our hotel partners is it's looking not just at the hotel individually and what is their rate shopping schedule, what are the prices, what are the changes, but is looking at a market level around what are the key changes, sending out push not notifications across all of the different um, devices that someone uses within the revenue management world. So, you know, my very strong advice to everyone is to look at your current business intelligence tools that you have and speak to the different providers that you have, the different market managers that you have, and just make sure, you know, are you getting the most up-to-date information? If it means that you're working with a rate shopping tool today that sends you a daily report at eight o'clock in the morning, every morning, and that's what your revenue and distribution team use, maybe you need to not be dramatic and change provider and go somewhere else. Obviously, if you want to do that, you know where to come but <laughs> at the same time you know talk to your current provider and say to them maybe we need to change the profiles maybe having our rate shopping report come at eight o'clock in the morning isn't relevant during this period of time maybe we need the updates more often more frequently maybe during this period we need to change our competitors our channels our segments our time in advance our occupancy per room our length of stay, because all of these key characteristics that we're working on normally change within the, a time of Corona, SARS, 9-11, volcano. It's not business as usual, it's different. And I think one of the key learnings that I have throughout my 23 years in the industry is we're all very good at setting up our hotels on booking.com when it was first launched or the GDSs when we opened the doors of our hotel or our website when we first launched it. But going back and changing things, updating the content around health and safety and what will happen in the event of a lockdown, going back and looking at the rate shopping profiles, going back and looking at the channel management. Do I work with all of the channels that I could be working with in the market that other people are working with? And really take stock, take some time to reevaluate the setup in all of the channels on all of the products and just make sure, you know, today is not a normal day. So what would I do if I was opening my hotel today as opposed to having opened it before? Um, and that's something that I think a lot of people tend to neglect in times of crisis. They say all of our data shows something that's bad maybe the competitors that you're looking at today or the channels you're looking at today are no longer the same as they were before so yeah a bit of advice I, there. <laughs> I i uh, my my clients i advise um right now too is uh, look at the broader concept because if you're only looking at five hotels uh on a rate shopping tool and you have one bad player or two bad players in there uh, it can really change your perspective but if you look at a broader comp set, um, it, you might um, think differently about uh, what's actually happening in the market. And it's good too, um, you know, going back to that rate discussion, um, focusing in, and this will be kind of my next question as well, um, focus in on your, your customer ratings, um, your quality ratings and so on. And if you're discounting at the level of a lesser competitor, um, are you sending a message to the customers um, by saying, hey, maybe there's something wrong with my hotel by pricing at their level? Um, any thoughts on that, Anat? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I, did, I didn't catch that, sorry. Okay, so Take it again. Take regarding quality ratings and pricing, yeah. um, you know, if we, if we drop pricing and yet we have a, a good quality rating, are we sending a wrong message to the customer out there um, yep. by, by having yep. such a low rate? Definitely. There's also the question of price positioning. And I agree with you that 
that if you have this this type of uh, value on chip, uh, the chip advisory ratings you get that this is the value of the, uh, value of the hotel that should be reflected on the pricing you have as well. Mark, any, any additional thoughts? Yeah, I, I was just going to say there's a bit of an add-on to that scenario as well that Anant is talking about. So there's the same, we've seen certain cases where hoteliers have said, okay, so we're going to, because we've got less occupancy coming in, we're now going to adapt the service that we're offering. And, you know, when we're looking at business intelligence data around hotels who have advised us of, changing their service, we normally find that there's a negative knock-on impact of that. So someone has picked my hotel because they like my hotel. They like the bar, they like the restaurant, they like the turndown service, they like the instant check-in with an iPad at the reception desk. If you then, during a time of crisis, go ahead and say, well, there's less people arriving, so we're going to not do daily mm -hmm. mate service anymore or we're going to close the bar permanently or we you know we're going to change the service in one way or the other there's normally a negative impact of that so trying yeah. to retain the brand identity i think is very key because the data that we look at says when you start to adapt to the uh, brand identity <coughs> and the service that's offered ultimately the business pickup is longer to come back and it doesn't stimulate occupancy it actually detracts from the occupancy and it's also because we are not uh, hotel industry not all of them hotels are high profitable hotels it's quite the margins are very low so there's always this balance to, to those you mentioned yourself mark that is a drop of 30 percent 38 percent on your customer base and yeah. 27 percent i think it was europe or overall so uh, and looking to edward lyon's question which we i was thinking of i don't know the figures uh uh how much layoff they did from 9 11 but i'm quite sure that it will have an effect uh, as emirates uh, asked them to take one month unpaid leave i'm quite sure that this will have have effect on the hotel and it might have the situation that some hotels will hit to have limited service this during some time. So it's always a balance. You need to survive as well. So you can't just uh, run a hotel on, on a negative profit. No. Uh, so so uh, let's hope that this doesn't keep on for too long. So Yes, for sure. Yep. Okay. And uh, the other question we had also was from, from uh, LinkedIn. Are some of the strategies used to target the driver market? So, so uh, in my way, my way, it's just the same strategies as you normally use. Uh, and and my my advice is also to be some people when during crisis you would like to actually save one. The easiest it was is save one is actually to save. My advice is not to save one. You should continue pushing and. Uh, actively be on the markets you believe that this is my driver market uh, as you have said mark you also consider different strategies haven't you been on the eight maybe think about that but uh, definitely even if the customer is not booking now you should work with them keep the relationship uh, because when it turns they will come to you who has kept the relationship with them so so uh, uh, you should definitely identify your driver markets and have the same same type of strategies you have today Great. So we're uh, just about out of time here. Um, and I just wanted to uh, let the two of you just kind of give uh, any final words, any advice that you have uh, for the audience here today. Uh, yes. Mark, uh, or and, uh, Mark. we'll start with you. Uh, is it Mark? I would like to just give some advice on uh, meeting events because uh, uh, there is, even if I said that there are a lot of translations we can see, there is a demand out there people will need to meet and i think the demand will be mainly domestic uh, but also uh, an advice to have a control on who is actually on the books and then maybe you can spend some more time to have a dialogue with those those groups you have on the books and see how how that situation looks like because if you could avoid cancellation by just having a and giving them confidence that we have things under control here 
that will save you a lot of lot of money to attract new customers. And if there is indication that there's a client on a rebook or cancel, better to do it as early as possible so you can actually take precautions and action uh, to mitigate that. Uh, so, so they don't wait to the last cancellation day to do the cancellations. Uh, and the last final advice, don't be afraid to overbook. We will have more cancellations than, than normally. So just overbook. We will, we will, we will definitely <clears throat> And it feels uncomfortable. That's overbooked. It's good advice on that. Uh, Mark, yeah. what's your final words? Um, so, you know, st strong advice here as well around a few things. Obviously, not to panic, but outside of not panicking, which is common sense, take some time to go back to the basics around what does my content look like on all of the relevant channels that I distribute on? Is it up to date on what people are concerned about today? Have a look at my channel strategy and my distribution mix. Have I held back on certain channels because formerly I didn't need them? And then have a look at what's happening within your local market. If there are airline routes that are canceled, make sure that you're not targeting them on media. Make sure you're not running active sales campaigns against markets that can't easily get to you and focus heavier on the domestic market at the moment, because that seems to be the more buoyant of, um, of the mix. Great, thank you. And then just my advice, uh, like uh, yours, don't panic uh, right now. Um, this is a time for us to really be strong leaders, uh, pay close attention to the external information and uh, find new information, not just uh, what you traditionally look at, but uh, make sure you're looking at uh, every angle of it. Um, be very transparent with uh, the stakeholders and with your owners. And then uh, finally, um, maintain really strong relations with all your partners, whether it be an OTA partner, uh, whether it be uh, your clients, um, make sure that you're walking with them through this difficult time as well and uh, have really strong relations so that when things start turning around, they think of you first um, and they come back uh, in strong numbers again. So I wanna thank everybody um, for your time here today. And uh, likewise, if uh, anybody has any additional questions, you can post them on LinkedIn and uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions after the fact as well. So uh, with that, uh, we'll close the session and uh, thank you for attending today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.